Well, good morning, Bridge, and uh, great to be back with you here at Northside. Happy New Year. It's a new year, and I, you know, my life quote is, the best is yet to come, and I, I think 2023, God has got some great things in store for us. And so we're going to look forward to whatever it is, and today, God's got a message for us. And I, I don't know if you've ever wished that God would just talk to you directly. I don't, I don't know if that's ever been a wish. Like, you could just get into the presence of God, and He would speak to you specifically. Um, and you wouldn't just hear about Him from people like myself, but you would hear directly from God. Is there anyone like that? You would just love to get a direct message from God. Yeah, me too. And you know, I, I remember my daughter Brittany one time just talking about why doesn't God make himself known, like really clearly, like, like you know, if, if there was like a scrolling marquee across the sky, do you remember the old computer uh, uh, screensavers where the message would march across the screen? I mean, wouldn't that be cool if God did something like that? You know, had his heavenly jet just put those contrails up there and, and tell us specifically, and we would know without a shadow of doubt that God is God. I like, couldn't God just spell it out a bit more for us? And I think my daughter's got a point. I, I wish, you know, that sometimes I would have something very clearly stated to me, a very special message from him. But you know, it is. It is amazing that God has given us his word. He's given us much more than a heavenly contrail, uh, a vapor trail from a, from a jet. He's given us a message from his word. And we're going to look at that today, an incredible message from God's word. And uh, he wants you to know something today. He wants us all to know. And then not just us, plural, but singularly, each person, each individual in this room, he wants you to know, first of all, that he's real, that he really is real, that he's genuine, that the living God of the universe is real. I know, Luke, we're all in church. Come on. We all believe that God is real. Why are you saying this? Well, I'm not naive because I know that the existence of God is being attacked everywhere. And even though we might do lip service or thought service to this idea that God is real, the fact is in education and media, pop culture, our peers, um, there's a lot of pressure to believe that God is not real. And maybe you're having trouble with all that pressure. Maybe you've got some doubts this morning. I know I've struggled with doubt in my life. And uh, thankfully, I have experienced over and over again the reality of God. And uh, it didn't have to come to me through vapor trails in the sky. Now, you may also have some doubts because of the way people have described God to you. And uh, God just didn't come through for you the way they described Him, right? And uh, so here at the bridge, we like to use all 66 books of the Bible to proclaim the reality of who God is and really look at what the Bible says about this God. And starting out in the very first verse of the Bible, we read that in the beginning, God created, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Part of our problem is that we have created God in our image, and uh, we've invented all kinds of different gods. Um, and, and, you know, here's the thing. I am somewhat with the atheists when it comes to believing in some of the gods that we have created. I don't believe in those kinds of gods either. See, some of this concept that God is a genie God, right? He's my personal body bar, uh, bodyguard or my personal assistant, and he just does everything that I want him to do for me. He's a genie God. And then some actually proclaim, at least they might not say this, but in essence, it's a boyfriend God, right? Or a girlfriend God, whatever. But, but the kind of God that gives you goosebumps, the God that makes you feel a certain way and... and uh, and then there's the anti-science God. There's actually uh, some controversy during COVID over this one here. And before we become too judgmental, um, let's talk about Francis Collins. He's got an incredible testimony. He was in the news some, not as much as Dr. Fauci. I think he was actually Dr. Fauci's boss. And uh, somewhat controversial, but let me tell you, this guy has an incredible testimony. He was raised in an atheist home. He was trained in molecular and, and, and biological science. But through a series of events, God revealed himself to Francis, and Francis became a committed follower of Jesus. And as a scientist today, he sees science as something that declares God's glory, not something to be rejected. Here's what Francis Collins said, I see DNA, the information molecule of all living things, as God's language, and the elegance and the complexity of our own bodies and the rest of nature as a reflection of God's plan. 
God is not anti-science. What other kind of, of, of gods do people have? Well, there's also the gap God, right? You know, he fills in the gaps when nothing makes sense. And when there are gaps to our understanding, we kind of say this thing like, oh, it must have been God. The gap God. And then finally, we've got the me God. The me God. And this is a God who thinks just like me. And he does whatever I would do. And truth is, a lot of theists, people who claim to believe in God, have ruined it for others. We have created a God in our own image, a God that does not uh, uh, exist. And so people come along and they say, well, I can't believe in a God like that. Well, I'm with them. I'm with you this morning if, if you don't believe in a God like that either and you've been kind of pushed away from this notion of God being real because obviously God is not my genie. I don't get everything I want. Anybody here get everything you want? And if you did, it probably wouldn't be good for you. And then the second one, the boyfriend God, folks, I, I can be feeling oriented at times, but I don't always get goosebumps when I worship. I, I, the Bible says we worship God in spirit and in truth. And, you know, sometimes I just worship because of the reality of who God is. I choose to worship, and I don't sometimes feel anything. Sure, I'm glad when the feelings are there, but I'm going to worship regardless of whether or not I have feelings. And then the anti-science God. It's hard for me to believe in a God that defies logic, quite frankly. The kind of God that doesn't make sense. A God that is anti-science, frankly, I think that's irrational. Seems to me that if there was a real God, and I believe this with all my heart, he'd also be the God, the author of logic and science. He'd be rational, and believing in him would be a logical thing. And the world he created would not defy his existence, but would reflect it, would glorify him. I, I don't know if you like, uh, I'm on Facebook, and there's this, lately all these pictures of the northern lights <laughs> and the galaxies. I don't know if any of you are picking up the same thing I'm picking up. Maybe it's because I hit like too often on them. But it's just amazing to me with the photography, with the Hubble and all these other telescopes and, and, and just the marvel of technology that brings to me the beauty of an incredible designer God. It reflects him. And then finally, if God were just like me, if I believe in the me God, um, if this God just thought like me, did things like me, folks, we would be in trouble. Amen? And let me bring that one step further. I mean, seriously, would you want a God like you <laughs> or some of you? And uh, we say, no way, Jose. No way. I mean, think about uh, Bruce Almighty. Anybody ever watch that movie? I mean, that would be a messed up world if you and I would be in control. So why should any of us want a God who thinks just like you or would do the things that you would do? Or why should we want a God who thinks like our politically correct culture today? Man, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? I mean, look at the dominant culture views that have changed in the last century. We'd have a God that would be constantly changing all the time. And maybe that's why some of us get mad because God thinks differently than us when it comes to morality, justice, and the human condition. Maybe it's because we've made God in our own image. See, I think a lot of Christians, unfortunately, promote these wrong images of God. And so we want to look at the biblical God. We want to talk about the God of the Bible this morning. We want to look at a lot of text. And uh, quite frankly, I know that if I had been led to faith on the belief of some of these gods, I would have walked away very quickly, right? If people would have brought me to faith based on any of these types of gods, I would have walked away because God didn't turn out the way I expected, the way they described. So that's the background of so many Christians, and especially those that are now deconstructing their faith. They have a wrong perspective, an erroneous understanding of God. See, we end up rejecting the God of our own making, not the God of the Bible. And when culture views change with regards to morality, and our understanding of God doesn't jive with that of our friends or Hollywood or the media or maybe our sociology professor at college, we're going to reject that God because that God has now changed. Well, like I said earlier, I don't believe in these gods either. And uh, so we want to approach our understanding of God based on a biblical objective perspective. I believe it's hard to deny 
his existence. For example, there was a debate a number of years ago uh, between two well-known philosophers. Uh, both were PhDs, both were intelligent, brilliant men. Uh, one was William Lane Craig. You may have heard of him. He's a premier Christian apologist today. Um, and the other one was a, a very prominent, outspoken atheist by the name of Antony Flute. And uh, years after that debate, the world was shocked when they learned that Flu actually said, I'm no longer an atheist. He says, scientific evidence, namely the mapping of the genome, has convinced me that there is indeed a real God who must be the creator of the universe. Antony Flew, in a book, wrote this here. There is a God. It's changed from no God. He said, we, what I think the DNA material has, has shown by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life. That intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinarily diverse elements to work together. Antony Flew believes, or believed before he passed away, that there was a God. Now, I believe that the God of the Bible is very real, but he's not the God of our own liking or making. He's God after all. He thinks beyond us, above us, and his thinking and his purpose and his plans, folks, we ought to be trying to figure those out rather than trying to make him in our image. In fact, we are obligated to think his way and do things his way rather than the other way around. He's not a fairy godmother. He's not here to answer your every whim. In fact, if you're a parent today and you have a child, there are things that, quite frankly, you know are not good for your kids. And so you serve them asparagus instead of chocolate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Is that right? And as, as God, God knows what's best. God's thinking is so far beyond, and he is not obligated to us at all. And yet, interestingly, he has obligated himself to us. He has created us on purpose and for a purpose. And the most important thing that we can do in our lives, folks, is that we can figure out what that is and conform ourselves to his way of thinking. If, it, if he really is God, and I believe that God could not exist if he wasn't perfect or good. This universe would not exist without God being good and having a real purpose. There could be no reality of a God, honestly. The only way the universe can exist is if God is good. Frankly, if I was God and in charge, I would have wiped it out multiple times by now, right? So we need to conform ourselves and figure out who this God is. And you might ask this morning, why did God make us? Well, the cool thing is he hasn't left us in the dark. He's told us everything we need to know about him and about us. And we have that in his word. In fact, essentially what we're talking about this morning is the message of the Bible. And if we were to boil everything in the Bible down to five essential truths, this is what we believe they are. The first one I've already said, and that is that God is real. He's real. He's a real God. And the other four, we're going to walk our way through because the second point is he loves you. And that is quite a statement to make that the supreme God of the universe, a universe that has no edges, we're so proud of our Hubble, right, and all the discoveries we can make, but we will never, ever plumb the depths of the universe. We will never get to the edge of it. We are trapped within our solar system, within our galaxy. Even though we can look beyond and look out, we have never gotten to the edges, and I don't believe we ever will. That God who created this incredible universe loves you. And from the earliest pages of what Christians call the Old Testament and throughout the Bible, God has declared this message that he loves us. Just a few examples here. Isaiah 43, you are precious in my eyes, and I love you. Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love, a love that never ends. It goes on forever and ever. And Jesus proclaims us as well when we get to the New Testament most of us, even if we've not been to church before, we've watched football games, right, where that big thing comes scrolling down out of the bleachers with John 3, 16, right? We know this verse, for God so loved the world, for God so loved, so loved the world, and we shouldn't skim over this thought. Think of this. If this is actually true, it is truly amazing. When you look at the awesome power on display in the universe, when you see this God who is so unbelievably organized and designed down to the smallest particles, the tiniest energies that we are able to scope out to a very limited amount of our knowledge, folks, this God 
in all this existence, this amazing designer and creator, he loves you and me. And not just humanity in general, but each individual. There's a passage where Jesus is preaching and he says that he knows every hair on your head. He numbers everyone. God knows every detail about you. This God of the universe loves you. That should blow our circuits. It's amazing. And when you think of it, it actually makes sense. Because why would God have made you, right? Why would he have made you a moral agent? What that means is you've got the ability to choose to love or to reject him. Why did he make you a living soul with a free will? Why would God make you with that? Why would God make anything? I love the way the old King James Version uh, says it in Revelation. You created, God, you created all things, and for your pleasure they exist and were created. God created all things to enjoy. God wants to enjoy us. Well, how could he possibly enjoy people who are so unique in all creation? Well, that's, folks, why we have this thing called a spiritual capacity. We're living souls. We're unlike the animal kingdom. We were created for a very specific purpose in this wondrous universe. We were created to accomplish something for God that, that nothing else can. Nothing else in the universe can do what we can do that God has created See, we are objects of his love, and we have the ability to love him back. That's why God made you, to love you. You were created to be loved by God and to love him back. You have that capacity, and he wants you to know that he loves you, that he literally wants a relationship with you. But there's a problem, and that leads us to the third truth that we need to discuss. See, God also wants you to know that we have sinned. And I know this is going into a really negative part of our message. A lot of times we don't like to be called sinners. We don't like to talk about this thing called sin. But folks, because of God's unique plan in creating us with a free will and desiring a reciprocal relationship with us, he gave us something that nothing else in creation has, this free will to respond to him or to reject him. Because without a free will, there is no capacity to love, right? Robots are incapable of love. We were made with the ability to respond in love. And when you think of it, even the highest forms of animal life do not have what we have. And as much as I love animals, none of them have the spiritual capacity. When you see a dog staring off into space, folks, it's not contemplating the meaning of life, all right? I I know some of you think your cats and dogs are are mighty special, almost up there on the level with humanity, but animals are not aware of God's existence. They simply live by instinct, right? We we don't think of animal activity as evil or righteous, right? We had a, I grew up on a farm in southern Ontario, Canada, and our dog would visit the neighbor dogs, right? And that wasn't an immoral act or anything like that, although the neighbors probably thought so. Um, Keep your dog at home. But, uh, Dogs do what they do to survive, right? And animals in the animal kingdom, some kill to eat. And they love those, or in a sense, I guess they love, but they're, they're committed, they're loyal to the ones that care for them and feed them. But they don't have the spiritual capacity. They live by instinct. They're incapable of worship. They're not spiritual beings, true worship. But God gave humans a soul, the capacity to choose. He gave us free will. We were made in his image. We have a soul. We were given a spiritual capacity to commune with, to love, or to reject the sovereign God of the universe. God gave us this capacity because he created us to enjoy this loving two-way relationship with him. Without that free will, folks, we could not practice genuine love. See, love demands a choice. Forced love is assault, right? And God is not guilty of assault. He loves you, and he wants you to love him. But in order for you to love him, you have to make a choice. You have to be able to choose to love him. And so when the Bible says that all people are guilty of sin, we are sinners, what it's referring to is that we were given the ability to choose not to love. We're given the ability to rebel, to turn away from this creator, to say, I'm going to live life my way. I'm going to do things my way because I'm, you know, I know as much as God does. Are you kidding me? But we've all done that. We've all chosen to go our own way. That's what sin is. It's simply doing 
what I want to do instead of doing what God wants, going my own way, doing my own thing, rather than going or doing God's way, and we're all guilty of it. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short. We fall short of God's glory. Now, I want you to think of that phrase, the glory of God, as His presence, God's presence. We have left the presence of God when we choose to sin. We rebel. We leave His presence. And I don't think I have to convince you of this. In your heart, you know, I know that the majority of the things that we do We do it in the moment. We do what's best for us. We're number one. We don't think what is God's best. We think of what we want throughout most of our daily lives. We're all guilty of sin. We know it in our hearts, and the Bible teaches us that we are guilty, guilty of sin. And that's a problem. That separates us from God, right? Because that's what sin does, a barrier between us and God. We are cast out of His presence, the Bible teaches us. That's what rebellion does, like a teenager that rebels against their parent, right? They leave home. They reject that authority. They run away. In the same way, folks, we cut ourselves off from a loving father. We run away who is our very source of life. Isaiah 59 says that our iniquities have made a separation between us and God. It separated us. The problem in a nutshell, folks, is that even though we were created to live in His presence, in a loving relationship with God, we have sinned and turned to our own way, and we've run away like a prodigal. We've essentially deserted that relationship. We've removed ourselves from God's presence, His eternal presence. It's one thing to say that we are now separated from God. It's quite another thing, though, to recognize the consequences of our sin, of our separation. See, when we are with God in His presence, we are in the presence of eternal life. We have life everlasting. For the Christian, death is just a transition to a greater life, to eternal life. It's really not death at all. But when we reject God, we turn ourselves over to eternal separation. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. See, God is our only life-giving source, both physically and spiritually. We exist because of God. Without Him, we are dead, dead physically and spiritually. And when we abandon God in our sin, when we cut Him off, we remove ourselves from His presence, our only life-giving source. And Romans 6.23 says it this way, the wages of our sin is death. It's death, folks. In separation, when we die physically, our body is separated from our spirit, right? And separation between us and God is a spiritual death. Our sin produces this. A wage is something you earn. You work a job and you earn a wage. And here in this this passage, we see that our sin earns us both physical and spiritual death. So when we die physically, we're separated from God and we remain spiritually dead for all of eternity. And that's the meaning of condemnation, being condemned, being separated from God forever and ever. Never again are we able to fulfill our purpose, to live eternally in relationship with Him. We're separated. That's the result of our sin, folks. I know it's a negative message. We're going to get to some good news soon. But unfortunately, it gets worse before we go to the good news because the Bible also talks about the existence beyond the grave. When we are eternally separated from God, it's referred to as a lake of fire. Look at Revelation 20, verse 14. Death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire, and this lake of fire is the second death the second death, folks. That is not only a physical death on the earth, but an eternal spiritual death following that physical death for those who have never repaired their broken relationship with God. And again, I know, this sounds awfully negative, awfully condemning, folks, but we're all in this boat. And in order to get good news, um, we got to first understand the bad news. I, I hope I've covered that well enough. See, a medical doctor does the very same thing, right? He can't give you or she can't give you the proper uh, treatment without a good prognosis, right? They they first have to do a very good diagnosis so we understand. And once we know the bad news, folks, then we're ready to listen to the good news, right? To To be able to receive the truth about our condition, we first need to hear what's wrong before we can figure out how to fix it. And so we've got to be honest with our human condition this morning. We've got to understand this idea of death of sin separating us from God. 
See, the honest truth is, folks, we are sinners, and because of our sin, we've been condemned to be cut off from God forever. That's the bad news. Are you ready for some good news? <laughs> Absolutely, me too. Because God loves us, He sent His Son for us. Despite our rebellion against God, even though we're all guilty of abandoning Him and going our own way, He didn't stop loving us. He's a good, good Father. Look at Romans 5.8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Way before the foundation of the world, the Bible says he already thought up a plan, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't a surprise. It didn't take God by surprise. He had a plan in place. We were created by God, and he loves us intensely so much that he came up with a plan before we even blew it. So much so that even though we've abandoned him and brought condemnation on ourselves, He came up with a plan to bring us back. Think about your kids that run away from home. If that's ever happened or you know somebody, you know the brokenness of the parent. And God's heart breaks when he sees us choose our own way. Folks, we are that teenage son. We are that teenage daughter who's run away from home. We are the one that's gone our own way thinking that we know better than our parent. And just like parents who love the prodigal folks, And I think God made us in his image. I think we get a sense of the depth of God's love when we become parents, don't we? God's put that within us. And God's love for us doesn't end just because we've sinned. Instead, he's done everything possible to bring us back, even though it took the greatest conceivable sacrifice to do it. Now, folks, I want you to listen to me carefully. I do love you. I really do. I I don't know many of you here, but I do love you. And I I care about your future, but there's no one here enough, no one here that I love enough that I would allow you to take my children or my grandchildren and torture them and kill them so that you could be saved. I just wouldn't do that. Folks, last August, I became a grandfather, and just last week, (laughs) I became a grandfather again. So this is little Avi, and this is Emmett, my two daughters. And I'm telling you, they they always said, you know, when the grandkids come along, there's something really special. I'm just like, ah, there's another baby. My kids are really special, but grandkids, whatever. No, it goes to another whole new level. How many of you grandparents know this? It's ridiculous, right? Yes, I love you, but I, honestly, I'm very sorry, but I would not allow them to be tortured and sacrificed for your sake. I just wouldn't. But God does, and God did, right? God loved us so much so that he sent himself in the form of his his son, Jesus. He sent Jesus for us. And even though Jesus didn't deserve to die, even though God takes on human flesh to do for us what we could not do, folks, you and I would never have done that, right? And it might be confusing to some of us. You know, why, for example, did Jesus' death solve the problem? I I get that. That's kind of a a deep theological discussion we could take many hours right now to try to understand, to fully explain the concept. But I think if we boil it down, it really, the essence of it comes to God's justice, right? See, God is a good God, but he would not be good if he also were not just. Justice and goodness, those have to go together. It's why you and I, we, we feel this thing rising up within us sometimes when there's an injustice either against us or someone else. We feel this thing. That's the image of God in you. God is a just God. He, re, he, he believes in justice, and goodness de- demands justice. God would not be just if he did not demand a penalty for the sin that we have committed. And because our sin has eternal consequences, it took a perfect man with an eternal nature to satisfy perfect justice. That's kind of the theological underpinnings to this whole thing. And because we're talking about human sin here, it would take a human being to make the sacrifice, but no human being in existence has ever been perfect enough to do it, right? The blood of goats and sheep, the Bible say, it was just keeping God's wrath at bay. So God, what does he do in his plan? He comes to earth First, he shows us the entire sacrificial system, but then he comes as a perfect sacrifice in the person of Jesus. Jesus lives a perfect life. He didn't deserve any of the punishment for anything that he had done, and yet he was punished in the most horrific manner. He was beaten, right, to within an inch of his his life with the, 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 I think they call it the cat-of-nine-tails. It was a horrible, horrible way to be tortured, whipped. 
And then finally, he was crucified on a cross. But I think even beyond the physical pain that Jesus suffered, it was a spiritual pain that really did him in. People say that Jesus died of a broken heart. He was a man who had never sinned. He gave up his life, never been guilty of anything, yet he took on the guilt of the entire world. The Bible says that God, the Father, actually looked away from his Son. The Son took all of this on himself. Jesus absorbed the guilt of every sin that I have committed and will ever commit and the sins of the entire world. And I don't think we can fully understand and grasp what that really means. See, God experienced the ultimate punishment for you and I. Jesus was separated from God as Father. There was literally a break in the Trinity. Blows my mind. I don't think we can fathom all the implications. Jesus experienced our condemnation when he died on a cross. Let's look at what Apostle Paul said. He was delivered over to death for our sins, but he was raised to life for our justification. There is the good news again. The Apostle Paul is explaining Jesus' death for us. First of all, it provided forgiveness, right? But Jesus didn't just stay dead. The forgiveness part. Yes, he was crucified. Yes, he was wrapped in a shroud, placed in a tomb. But on the third day after his death, he rose again. He came back to life. And so when this verse says he was raised for life, for our justification, okay? This is referring to the eternal life, the justification of us. It's a miracle that seems almost hard to believe, but it's really not because we're talking about God, after all, who created life. He can definitely bring back people to life. And that's what he did in raising his own son, in a sense, raising himself from death. It kind of blows my theological circuits at times. But it was Jesus' death that provided forgiveness for our sins, enabling us to be reconciled to our creator. And because our life was lost in sin and because of the resurrection, we now can have a new life, an eternal life. We are no longer left in spiritual death. Jesus' resurrection provided for us a new life, a renewed eternal life. And if we're attached to Jesus and our sins are nailed to that cross and his resurrected eternal life is real in us, we will live forever. That's good news. And it's our only hope. Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Folks, I lived in Asia for 10 years and there's a lot of philosophies and beliefs out there and there are many gods and, and good people that have said things like, I will show you the way, I, I, will, I will teach you the, about life. But Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth and I am the life. That's been my experience. He really is. He's the air I breathe. He is our only way to be saved. He is the only way to eternal life. He's our only way back to God. And that leads us to the fifth and final truth for today. You and I can be saved. That's good news. We can be saved. And I I know when we look at this and, and we think, you know, great, the problem's been solved, right? Jesus died, rose again, we're all going to heaven. And yes, Jesus died for us and rose again. But remember, because of God's love for us, this idea of a free will, He gave us something nothing else in creation has, the ability to choose to follow him or not. God will not force you into heaven. He doesn't grab anybody by the hair and drag them off to his cave. That's not God. He's not forceful. He made a sacrifice and he invites us. He welcomes us in. The Father gave his son for you. And now Jesus offers himself to you to be be your savior. You can be saved. But there's one thing, you have to respond. You have to respond to that invitation. The wages of sin is death, yes, but the free gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. You can't earn it, you can't buy it, and you don't deserve it, but you must receive it. That's what you do with a gift. And I I don't know if you're like me, we just came through Christmas, and all those beautifully wrapped gifts under the tree with the nice bows on top, do any of you struggle with like, like opening them up because you might ruin the packaging? Is anybody else like that? And it's kind of crazy, but you know, there's something inside the gift that will make my next year better or help me. Maybe it's a book that'll help change my thinking for the better or whatever, but I don't want to open the gift. I don't want to ruin the packaging, right? And uh, I think it's easy to do that with the gift of salvation. We hear this amazing story. We, we recognize that, wow, God, the story of your sacrifice with your son, it's beautiful. And man, you didn't have to do all this, but wow, I love it. And I admire and applaud the packaging. 
But folks, it doesn't do us any good. We have to open it. We have to receive the gift. We have to unveil the beauty and the glory for us personally for it to have its impact. God is offering his gift of salvation, but we have a choice. Will we continue to go our own way to figure life out on our own? Will we continue to sin, which is rebel against what he knows is best for us? The sovereign God of the universe who runs, who knows, who understands, who sustains. Will we go his way or turn our back on him? Will we receive this gift of forgiveness, this eternal life? Will we be saved? That's a choice that we have to make. John 1.12 says that as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Some of you maybe today have been in church for a while. Maybe this is your first time. I, and you've been admiring the packaging for a long time. You like the story. And maybe you've even believed in your head that Jesus is God's son. Maybe you believe that he died and rose again, but you've actually never personally taken off the wrap, busted it open, received it for yourself. And if you were to die today, you really don't know that you would be going to heaven. And today, God wants you to be sure. He wants you to know that you are saved. We want to give you that opportunity. John wrote in 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. God wants us to know. Do you know today? You can know. Paul explained it very simply. If you confess if you speak it out with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, in other words, God, your boss, you can run my life so much better than I can. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you believe that, you will be saved. Paul tells us that because Jesus died and rose again, we can be saved if we repent, if we turn away from our own way, if we have faith. When he says, confess that Jesus is Lord, he's talking about what the Bible calls repentance. In our sin, we think we're in charge of our life, right? We like to say things like, this is my life, God. Don't you touch it. Don't you tell me what to do. But folks, that is our sin speaking. When we repent, we have a change of mind, a change of heart. We no longer view ourselves as lords of the universe, as being in charge. Rather, we recognize God as our master and our boss, our, our Lord. And from now on, you are in charge of our lives so to be saved, we repent. We turn away from us. We change our thinking about God and about us. We acknowledge our need for him to be in charge of our lives. Paul says, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That word believe, it's translated from this Greek word pistuo, and it's usually translated as faith when we read the word faith in our Bibles. And it means to trust in or to depend on. Paul says that if you, if you repent, you change your thinking and then you believe and you trust in God. He, he actually has this. He will save you. You depend on his crucifixion and his resurrection for your salvation. You will be saved. In Romans 10, 13, yet, um, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will, not might be, will be saved. Paul is very, very sure on this with this passage. And it's a promise, folks, in the context of repentance of faith. Paul says, if you want to know that you are saved, just ask God to save you, and he will. You will be saved. And that's something you can do right now. I want to give you a chance to do that today. Some of you maybe here today have never actually done that. And I want to give you a chance to know without a shadow of doubt that you can be saved. And here's the cool thing, guys. We, we don't have to do anything. We just need to receive. You don't have to join our church. You really don't. You don't have to perform any, any religious rituals this morning. You don't have to stand up and say anything out loud. You just need to receive. Jesus did everything necessary to save you, and now he's offering that gift to you and I. All you need to do is receive it, to repent, to believe, to put your trust and faith in him, and his promise is, is that you will be saved. So the bottom line in today in, in light of these five truths if you died today, would you know with a shadow of a doubt that you are saved, that you are on your way to heaven? God doesn't want you to wait until after you die to find out. He wants you to live the rest of your life completely assured that you are his, that you belong, that you are in his presence, that you are going to heaven. And if you're not sure, let's get it settled today. So when you head home after this service, 
You know without a shadow of doubt, I've settled it. I know him, and he knows me. I am a child of God. So would you bow your heads? God, I want to thank you for everyone who is here today. I want to thank you, Lord, so much for the truths from your word. We've learned today that you love each of us, and we've also learned that we have a problem. It's our sin. It's our way. But we thank you that you sent Jesus to die for us. And we thank you, Lord God, for raising him up again so we can have eternal, renewed life. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus and through your Holy Spirit, I'm asking you right now to save those who are here today who have not yet received you. Give them that assurance today of your eternal life. Folks, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, some of you know that this message was for you today. God planned for you to be here to hear this message because your greatest need is salvation and eternal life. So why not in your heart right now? Reach out to him. Trust in him to save you. Just ask him. He promised that he will save you if you just ask him. And you can, you can believe that promise that if you ask, he will do it. And I, I can give you the words to pray, but I want you to pray them for yourself. If you mean them sincerely, I'd like you to pray after me quietly right now. Dear God, I know that I've sinned. God, I know I've turned away from you. And God, I am truly sorry. But I believe that Jesus died for me. And I believe that you rose again from the dead, Jesus. So please forgive me. Please save me and give me the assurance of heaven. Thank you, God, for saving me. Amen. Listen, I know that for a lot of you, that was nothing new. A lot of you are children of God. But for some here today, this might have been the most important day of your life. Just now, you did something that changed the entire trajectory of your future, especially for your eternity. You've received a gift, a gift of God's salvation. Today on January 8, 2023, you became a lifelong committed follower of Jesus. You're a child of the King. It's a pivotal point for all eternity for you. And so I want to pray again. Father, I want to thank you. Thank you for those who in their hearts, who declared you as their master, their boss, their, their Lord and Savior today. Father, I want to thank you for everyone who prayed to receive you as Lord and Savior. God, give them courage to tell others of this new faith that they have in you. And Lord, all of us here today, help us to grow in our relationship with you. Folks, with your heads still bowed and your eyes closed, just before we finish, I want to give those of you that responded and prayed the prayer to receive Jesus, I want to give you a response to let me know that. Paul wrote that those who believe in Jesus will not be ashamed. And I know you're not ashamed of that decision. And I don't want to embarrass you, I, 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 but I'd love to pray for you right now. So with all the heads bowed out there and all the eyes closed, would, would you, if you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up and you can even look at me and, and I'll, I'll try to recognize you through the darkness here. Would you just let me know right now by raising your hand, looking up here? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Father, thank you for every person who has decided to let you be Lord and Savior of their lives. Father, thank you that we have the gift of eternal life, that we can have the assurance of knowing that not only that you are real, but that you loved us, that you sent your son for us because of our problem called sin, and that we can have eternal life, that we can have the assurance to know that we will be with you forever. We love you, God. We commit the rest of this year to you. May we live for your pleasure, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.